All righty, my friends, how you doing, first of all? Everybody good? Good day to be in church. Welcome everybody at our 288 campus, Friendswood campus, Alvin campus, Webster campus, Pearland campus, online campus, and everybody at the Weibo Bible Church in Weibo, Montana, where last weekend during church it was negative 31 degrees, which is another way of me saying to you, stop whining. <laughs> Talking to myself there. Uh, we are in week three of a series uh, that we're calling Up on the Roof. It's all about marriage, Up on the Roof. And um, uh, we, in the series, we've uh, talked about several things, about rain on the roof. That was uh, week one. We talked about the, uh, uh, building your marriage on the foundation that God had intended for us. And, uh, and, and then last week, we talked about hiding on the roof, which is all about closing the distance gap between husband and wife in a marriage relationship, and uh, uh, we talked about living together according to knowledge about love and respect. All these uh, uh, sermons and so forth are on uh, our website. Uh, you can go to our website, get to our YouTube page if you missed any, any lessons and catch up. But today, we're going to talk about another important topic on the roof, and it's temptations. Temptations on the roof. Our, our temptations on the roof passage comes from 2 Samuel chapter 11, but let me give you some context before we read the text, okay? David was king of Israel. He was highly respected and loved. He had won many battles, done a lot of good things for Israel, but he let his guard down and it cost him more than he could have ever imagined. And that, my friends, is what sin does. Sin, sin always, 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 always uh, takes you further than you want to go and uh, costs you more than you think you'll ever have to pay. But uh, let's look at the text and then we'll talk about it. Second Samuel uh, chapter 11, we're going to begin at verse 1 where it says this, in the spring of the year, the time when kings do what? Go out to battle. So David's a king, so uh, this is fighting season, I guess, back in the Bible, fighting season. Uh, so so uh, David's a king, so where should he be? He should be going out to battle, right, with his men. Uh, in the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to, to war, David didn't. He sent his right-hand man, Joab, and his servants with him and, uh, and the armies of Israel. That's what that means, all Israel. And they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David didn't go. He didn't go. He remained at Jerusalem. So just already in the very first verse, we got a guy who who is not where he's supposed to be, which is always a problem when it comes to temptation. We're not where we're supposed to be either physically or in our heart. Verse two, it happened late one afternoon when David arose from his sofa after playing video games and was walking. <laughs> he, he, was, he was walking where? On the roof of the king's house that he saw from where? The roof, a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman, and uh, someone, someone said to David, is this not Bathsheba? Which, by the way, I've always thought that was interesting that a woman caught taking a bath is named Bathsheba. <laughs> is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So I think with this person right here, this one, this someone, I, I don't know, I could be wrong, but I, I feel like what they're trying to do is to get David to not do what he's thinking about doing. I think this person is like, dude, she's got a family. She's married. She's got a husband. So what did David do? So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. So a uh, major, major, major mistake. And what happened here is that David used his status to get what he wanted. Nowadays, we call that abuse of power. But uh, you fast forward, Bathsheba finds out that she's pregnant. So David wants to cover up his sin. So he calls for her husband to be brought home from the battlefield so that he would sleep with her so that he could somehow escape suspicion. But when Uriah got back to town, he didn't sleep in his home. He didn't sleep in his bed. He slept out on the ground, <laughs> out on the ground. And somebody said, why are you sleeping on the ground? Why not, you know, go uh, to your home with your beautiful wife? And he said, because my brothers are out on the battlefield. They're sleeping in tents. They're sleeping on the ground. They're risking their lives. I could not do such a thing. He was a good man, in other words. So what did David do? David had him killed. Um, the child was then born, 
but died soon after. And all of this started with a long, inappropriate look from the rooftop. And it's incredibly tragic. It's a tragic story. Uh, and that's because, as I said, sin always takes you farther than you want to go and costs you more than you expect to pay. Every time, every time. Sometimes I watch that TV show, Cops. Anybody watch the show, Cops? Okay. I mean, I watch even the old ones where the, where the picture doesn't even fit your screen anymore, you know? And back when all the police officers had big mustaches, you know? And, and what cracks me up in a way, is when sometimes when they catch somebody, you see it on a regular basis on the show, they'll, they'll catch somebody, like somebody is, has stolen a car and wrecked it now, and, and, and they're getting arrested, and, and the police are saying, well, what were you doing? You know, why, why'd you steal this car? And, and the guy will say something like, you know, I, was, I wasn't, I wasn't going to steal, I was going to bring it back, you know, I was borrowing it. And, or whatever, lame excuse. And so they're reading, they read him his rights, they, they have him cuffed, they're gonna put him in the back of the car. And, and you hear this on a semi-regular basis on the show. The person that they're about to put in the squad car says things like this, hey, 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 I'm just gonna go home. I'm just, I'm just gonna go home. You say, take the cuffs off me, uh, of me because I'm just gonna go home. <laughs> like, you, you don't get it, do you? You don't get it. Uh, here's the truth of life that a lot of people don't get. We're free to choose to do whatever we want to do. Did you know that? You have free choice. You can do whatever you want to do. You can. But we're not free to choose the consequences. And so when you do something, especially things that you should not do, to which there are consequences, the consequences automatically begin to take effect. And nowhere in this life are the consequences of sin more magnified than in marriage. So what I want to do today is, up on the roof, I just kind of want to look at uh, three of the most devastating on-the-roof temptations uh, and how to overcome them. Now, I say three of the most devastating according to the stats. These are three of the biggest temptations, biggest sins that ruin a lot of marriages. Okay, so let's just talk about it today. The first one is this, and David already got us here, so let's talk about it. Unfaithful behavior. Unfaithful behavior, talking about affairs, talking about infidelity. This is a marriage killer, and the stats bear that out. A couple doesn't have to get divorced if this happens, but more often than not, it is a deal breaker. And, 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 and both men and women have affairs. Did you know that? You know, both men and women have affairs. I know sometimes when we talk about things like this, it's always the husbands. It's, you know, it's the men who are dirt, you know. And uh, men are made of dirt. It's biblical, by the way. <laughs> However, however, women don't lag too far behind when it comes to this particular sin. They don't, they're a few percentage points behind, but still, uh, so women dirt as well sometimes, okay? Uh, so anyway, uh, infidelity always has widespread, long-lasting detrimental effects. And it's not just on the, on the, on the marriage, not just on the, the people that are involved in the marriage, but it's on if there's kids, it, it, it affects them for a long, long time, if not for, for their entire lives. It also affects the people who trusted that person. Because whenever an affair happens, there's deceit involved. And so you got friends, you got extended family members who are also hurt. They feel betrayed because this person lied or lied to their face or misled them or whatever. So, so it always hurts a lot of people. It's not just the person, the other person in the relationship. So according to the stats, once again, I'm, I'm going to give you the, the, what they say are the top three um, uh, top three places where affairs begin. Uh, first one is this, work. Work, and this was David's angle right here. He was king, it was his kingdom. So he was the boss. He had the respect of the people around him and of his countrymen and women. And so he used that for nefarious purposes. And for men who end up cheating at work, it's always a very, very predictable pattern. He gets respect at work from a, from a female coworker or a client, respect that maybe he thinks that he does not get at home and deserves at home. And, and then he, like David, has an affair. But by the way, I'm, I'm just gonna, I feel like I need to insert a question here. 
just to make sure that we're all on the same page about this subject. And so the question is this, if a husband is not getting the respect, and this is what we talked about last week, okay, love and respect. If a husband is not maybe getting the respect at home that he thinks he deserves, or he thinks he's not getting it, maybe he is, but he thinks he's not getting it, is it okay then for him to have an affair with someone who is giving him Respect, would that be a thumbs up or a thumbs down? Thumbs, is it okay? Is it not okay? Is it, all right, come on, show me. Okay, okay, not okay, right? Not okay. So just to make sure we're on the same page. Another place that you kind of have to watch yourself is the gym. The gym and people who don't go to the gym right now are saying, "Why the gym?" <laughs> Couple reasons. Um, one is that when people show up at the gym, they are uh, uh, dressed to work out, which means uh, uh, with less clothing than normal. And, and, so, and, and, and so there may be some words that are said, some compliments flying back and forth. I don't know, okay, um, uh, uh, what does it for some people? But, but maybe, let's just let's pick on the ladies now on this one. Picked on the men on the first one. Here, here, let's talk about the ladies. Let's say uh, she shows up at the gym and she's wearing, you know, the, the clothes. And, and <laughs> so, and, and, and someone else is making her feel very beautiful, very beautiful and value. And he's like, yeah, yeah, you, you know, it's whatever you're doing, it's working, it's working. <laughs> I mean, I'm, see, I'm seeing it, I'm trying not to look, you know, I'm seeing it, you know what I'm saying, you know what I'm saying, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, and so she feels like somebody else is noticing, somebody else is encouraging, you know? And, and maybe it's not like a creepy guy, like I just sounded like, maybe it's, uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe it's like somebody that she trusts and looks up to and, and, uh, and he's complimenting her and, and uh, and she's feeling things down deep inside that she hasn't felt in a long time. By the way, if you, if you Google this when you get home, uh, there is a science to this as well. When your heart rate gets over like 100 and something beats per minute and you're around other people, there's an automatic connection that takes place as you're going through whatever together. Ooh, okay. <laughs> I'm just saying watch out. Uh, so a uh, question for you. Is it okay f- for a woman at the gym, let's say, uh, to, to cheat on her husband when she is not getting as much encouragement as ho- at home as uh, Franz is giving her at the gym. <laughs> is, it, is it okay for her to cheat? Uh, okay, okay, it's not, not okay for her to cheat. And then there is uh, social media. Social media, and, and it doesn't feel like a place, but this is a place. This is a place where people can check out what's going on in everybody else's life, and, and so there's uh, people liking each other's pictures. There's uh, uh, maybe a compliment about the picture, and, 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 then, and then checking out to see who that is that's complimenting, and then uh, digging through their photos, and, and maybe a direct message. Uh, it may be an old friend. Maybe an ex-boyfriend or ex-girlfriend, and, and uh, maybe you get a direct message, and it's like, you know, still, th- still think about you. <laughs> it's hard for me to even mimic this, but <laughs> still thinking about you, but, uh, you know, I just noticed, and you've gotten more uh, beautiful with age. Wow. You know, or more handsome with age, and... and uh, and really, you think so? Oh, it's so sweet. It's so, so sweet. And um, uh, next direct message, yeah, you know, I, I'm over at such and such, and maybe, you know, we could uh, get a coffee or, or something sometime, just talk, and, and uh, oh, that's so sweet. Yeah, just concerned about it, you know, and, and want to see how it's going. And, and uh, it's, it feels sweet. It feels like, oh, that's okay. It's not okay. Okay? It's not, I feel weird even saying it out loud. It's not okay. Because if you play that out to the end, where that feeling is taking you, like drawing you to that person, you play that out. Go ahead and just fast forward this this bad movie. And where it ends is the demise of your marriage, okay? Now, all three of these places, just so you know, work's not bad, the gym's not bad, social media uh, can be a, a great thing as well. But these can become a place where there's a rooftop temptation. They can become the rooftop when a spouse begins to enjoy that 
attention or that respect or that encouragement or those feelings of excitement that they don't maybe feel though as though they're getting at home. And it is new and it is exciting and, and that's one thing that uh, people who've committed adultery say that it's exciting, it's exciting. But I'm gonna add something to that today. It's deadly. It's deadly. And today, all of our campuses and whoever's watching this, you know, in, in the days to come on the internet, I just want you to know something. If you're, if you're feeling those things right here in your heart with someone who is not your spouse, you're on the roof. You're on the roof and you better watch out. Now in the Old Testament, we have the very straightforward commandment. In fact, it's in the 10 commandments, number seven. <clears throat> Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not commit adultery, which is a very physical thing. So when you think, okay, here's two people and uh, look, they're not committing adultery. They're not committing adultery. They're not committing adultery. They're not, co okay, now they're committing adultery. So it's a very, you, you understand that. It's a very physical thing. <clears throat> so it's not necessarily uh, uh, looking, it's not necessarily talking, it's not necessarily um, direct messages, <clears throat> but there's a line in, in, in adultery when we think about it, and a line that uh, cannot be crossed is physical, okay? But then Jesus comes along, and a lot of people think that Jesus made things easier than the Old Testament. He actually made things more difficult, and this is one of those. He says, you've heard that it was said. He's making reference to the Old Testament. That's what this always means. You shall not commit adultery. You've heard it that way. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her where? In his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. So... At this time, at all of our campuses, our ushers are going to pass out sharp sticks. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. It's one of my favorite jokes right there. Um, but Jesus is not saying, poke your eyes out. That's the, he doesn't want you to poke your eye out. That's not the point, okay? The point is, he wants us to stop the progression of sin by stopping it where it starts, right here. He wants us to stop it here. By the way, this is a good time to go here since we are here. You know, in the New Testament, whenever the Bible says sexual sin or sexual immorality, um, most of the time it is translated from one of two Greek words, pornea or pornos. Pornea or pornos, yes, you're hearing me correctly, P-O-R-N, porn. So according to Jesus, if you're looking at a woman lustfully, that's a sin. That's a sin. So can I, can I say something right now? Can I say something? Lord, give me favor. If you're on OnlyFans and you're a participant in that in any way, if you're going to Pornhub, or if you're looking at wrong images on Instagram or Facebook or anywhere else, according to Jesus, you're committing adultery right here. Now, the argument has always been on this subject. It's not hurting anyone, but I would beg to differ, it is. And I say that because if you're married, your eyes belong to your wife, and so you're stealing time and attention from her and you're giving it to something else. And if you're single and you're looking at porn, you're messing up your mind. And you're making it more difficult for you to ever relate to a, a woman in a God-honoring, pure way again. Especially, especially if you get off into the far reaches of that stuff. You're, it's, it's gonna be difficult for you to come back, okay? Uh, to, to where you should be in your, in your heart and in your mind. But so many guys fall for this. And the reason is, is because it's easy. It's everywhere, but it's easy. It, you know, and I say it's easy because a, a video or an image never has a headache, never has a bad day, never says not tonight. 
But an image is not a real person. An image, if, if you don't know, on a screen is just a bunch of pixels arranged in such a way as to fool your mind into thinking that you're having a romantic encounter. But it's not a real woman. It's pixels on your phone. You think about that. You're having an encounter with your phone, okay? Which is weird. Uh, even, though, even though lust is a cheap substitute for intimacy, guys often choose it because real intimacy with a real woman is difficult. A picture will never turn you down, never criticize you, never hurt your feelings, but listen to me, it'll never love you back. And it won't be there to comfort you and pray for you when you get a bad diagnosis. It won't be there to walk through, with you uh, through difficult times in life or to build a home with you and a family with you. It is an evil, cheap substitute that the devil is using to steal your time, your attention, your affection, and your energy from your wife. So. Get off the roof and invest in your wife. Yes, intimacy is hard work. Yes, you have to talk sometimes. Yes, you have to listen all the time. Yes, you have to do life together. And yes, life is not always easy and exciting. And, and yes, you have to keep your commitments. And yes, you have to bring home a paycheck that you see very little of. And yes, you have to help around the house. And you have to wait patiently while she's sick or she's going through some other of life's difficulties. But that's what marriage is. And it's God created, and it's God ordained, and it is holy, and it is good. Amen? Amen. So, so how do you overcome unfaithful behavior and temptation? First of all, you know you. You know you. Every single person who struggles in this area at all knows when they're most tempted. You know where your rooftop is already. Is it when you're mad at your spouse? Is it when it's late at night and your spouse is already asleep? Is it, uh, is it at work with a, another person or at the gym? Uh, every person that struggles with this knows when the devil is gonna try to get us to entertain thoughts in our heart or to do stupid things. So once identified, once you see where the rooftop is for you, then get off the roof. Get off the roof, okay? Listen to me. It's not weakness to avoid temptation. It's a sign of strength. And by that, I mean, if you were an alcoholic, you wouldn't go to a bar, order a drink, put it in front of you, and then start yelling, look at me, I'm so strong. I got a drink in front of me, and I'm not drinking it. Woohoo! People would go, you're an idiot, Okay. The strength is not in doing that. The strength is not going into the bar, right? And when it comes to this temptation, the strength is not in flirting with the temptation. The strength is in avoiding the temptation. And so on this subject, if that means you have to make some changes in your life and your schedule and your habit, delete some apps, uh, block some people, you know, on direct messages, change your streaming services, change your interactions at work or at the gym, whatever it is. If, if it means you got to change something, then do it. Then do it so that you can be faithful to your spouse and to God, not only in your actions, but also in your heart. Okay? Next one. Next on the roof temptation. Unresolved conflict. Unresolved conflict. Now, this is another one of the top identifiable marriage killers. This is when couples just kind of hit an impasse and can't work through conflicts, and so they give in to the temptation to quit trying. And before you know it, there's this impenetrable, unscalable wall that exists between them uh, that, that even goes right down the middle of their bed. But uh, there is a way out, and it's from Scripture, of course. Ephesians chapter 4 says this, in your anger, do not sin, do not let the sun go down while you're still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. So when we go to bed angry, what happens is instead of working through the wall and dismantling it, we start adding to it. And uh, uh, maybe you've been here, done this, you're laying in bed and you're back to back, you know, because you don't want to face them. But you're laying there and you're, you're recalling all the things that they've ever done or said that are wrong. 
like all the way back to when you were dating. You're going back that far. Instead of getting uh, hysterical, you're getting historical. And <laughs> you're adding it up and you're making a list and you're checking it twice. By the way, you know what the Bible calls the devil in the book of Revelation? The accuser. It says he accuses the saints before the throne of God day and night. Always accusing, always accusing. So when you're laying there, getting your accusation list together for your spouse, are you being more like Jesus or more like the devil? You're being like the devil. I, think, I don't think I have to say this out loud. Don't be like the devil. Okay, I said it anyway. We're not supposed to be like the devil. We're supposed to be like Jesus. So what was Jesus like or what is he like? Well, Jesus loved us, his bride, with an agape love. Agape love. And that love is perfectly described for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, otherwise known as the love chapter of the Bible. And here's what it says. Love is patient, it is kind, it does not envy, it, it, it does not boast, it is not proud. And I would add here, not, not, not too proud to work things out, okay? It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. It doesn't make a list. You with me? So in order to get here, we, we, we can't be too proud to forgive, or, uh, to forgive or to say that we're sorry. And when we do that, then we can let it go. Now, why would we do that? Why would we want to let it go? Because that's what Jesus did for you. He let it go for you. You can't keep doing this. If you, want a, if you want a good marriage, you can't keep doing this. You have to learn to let it go. You know, it was about like five or six years into the beginning of our church that I had a, a folder full of hate mail. And when I say hate mail, I mean things that uh, people had written to me that just told me I was a terrible pastor and I couldn't preach and, you know, the church was never going to make it, on and on and on. You, very creative. People are very, very creative. And it was a pretty good uh, folder uh, of, of, hate, of hate mail. And so I kept it in my desk drawer, second drawer down, right-hand side, right there. And every now and then when I was working, I would just like get it out and read through them. And I know that's idiotic, and I admit that today. But back then, I thought, well, this is giving me some motivation, because I'm going to show them. You know, so someday, I'm going to learn how to preach. <laughs> Eventually, I'll be okay. I'll be a decent pastor. But I kind of used it as awkward, weird motivation. One day, I'm at my desk. I got my Bible out. I've got my pad of paper here. I'm having my quiet time. I'm reading. I'm writing things down. And all of a sudden, I really feel like the Lord brought that folder to my mind. And it was like it was on fire right beside me, you know, that I couldn't quit thinking about it. And it occurred to me that the Lord wanted me to get rid of it. Like, why are you doing this? Get rid of the folder. And so during my quiet time, I reached down, opened that drawer, took that folder out. We were at the strip mall at the time. And I walked across the parking lot of the strip mall to where the dumpster was, and I took that folder, and I threw it up in the air above the dumpster, and all those notes came, which is weird. It, when I first had the inclination that that's what the Lord wanted me to do, I was like, oh, no, I've worked hard to get all those notes, you know? <laughs> and I didn't want to throw them away. But I, I was trying to be obedient to the Lord. I threw them. I'm going to tell you, man, something happened in that moment. Something happened in that moment when I let it go. And I turned around to walk back to that strip mall, and I described myself in those moments as, as being Napoleon Dynamite after he got the cheap suit at the resale shop. You know, that <laughs> slow motion scene where he's walking. And I felt like that walking back. I felt so free because I had let it go. And, and I'm not perfect in any way, but that's something that I have gotten right in my life is that I forgive instantly now. I don't carry that stuff. I forgive instantly. And let me tell you how this is a freeing way to live. You don't have to remember who's mad at you or who you're not supposed to like. So I can go anywhere. I can go into any store. It doesn't matter who I see. 
I'll go give them a high five, you know, even if they hate my guts. I'm like, give me a hug, come here, you know? And I know it's probably annoying for some people, but I just want to forgive. I just want to, I just want to treat other people with love. And in your marriage relationship, if you're doing the opposite, if you're holding on to things, you are just doing this all of the time, all the time. You ever been to a demolition derby, anybody? If you've never been, you gotta go sometime, okay? They're awesome. I would go to one today if I knew there was one happening. But it's loud, and there's these bone-jarring collisions, there's fires, and there's no winners. And I say that because even the winning car looks like this right here. He's like, yeah, I won, here's my trophy, can you give me a ride home? (laughs) It's fun to watch when it's old cars. It's zero fun to watch when it's a relationship. And if you go to bed mad, laying there, trying not to make a sound because you don't want them to have any intel on how you're doing whatsoever, but you're laying there and you're thinking about everything that they've ever done wrong and making up some more stuff along the way, what we're doing is we're participating in something that's only going to end up in a wreck of a marriage. And God says what we're doing at that time is we're giving the devil a foothold. Marriage is hard enough without giving the devil free rent in your life. So according to this verse, we have a couple of options, Uh, uh, maybe. We can stop the sun from going down, (laughs) which is impossible, and I don't think that's what this means, agreed? Or we can get over it, we can get over it. And I think that's actually the correct answer here. We can get over it, we can say we're sorry, we can forgive. Uh, We can hug it out, then we can go to bed. And every morning, just like God's mercies are new every single morning, we can start with a clean slate, relationship intact, not giving the devil free rent in our marriage, but giving God the glory in our marriage. Amen? That's the way it's supposed to be. Now, I know that there's probably couples that are listening right now, and you've got some real issues, like like deep-seated issues that that you need some help with. And so I would encourage you to go to a Christian marriage counselor. There is zero shame in having somebody else walk through those difficult conflict resolution things. There's zero shame in getting somebody that knows what they're doing to help you uh, to walk through this together. And it's that important that... that, uh, you make the effort, okay? So unfaithful behavior, unresolved conflict, and then number three, unrealistic expectations. Unrealistic expectations. This is another, believe it or not, top marriage killer. Now, back in the day, Jane and I used to go to um, some model homes sometimes. Anybody like going to the model homes? It's kind of cool, isn't it? But we always had kind of the same reaction. It's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. Everything matches. And... and, uh, there's no clutter. There's no clutter. It's incredible, you know? And you think, I wish we could live here. But, but like 10 minutes after you moved in, there would be clutter, right? That's how it is. And, but you walk around, there's, there's, there's uh, no dishes left in the sink because the, you know, dishwasher was full and nobody took the dishes out yet. There's none of that going on. There's no dust. There's no worn places in the carpet, no scratches on the floor, no garbage in the garbage can. It's beautiful, and it's an illusion. It's an illusion because real families make messes. And we all may be tempted to think that our marriage is going to be a model home kind of marriage. It's never going to have any issues whatsoever. But newsflash, even in multi-million dollar homes, you got to take out the trash. One of my favorite verses of all time. (laughs) You think I think I'm weird, but... Proverbs 14, 4, a clean stable brings no profit. Do you get it? If you got no, no animals in your stable, you're not going to have a profit. I used to use this against my dorm mom in college. My, <laughs> seriously, my dorm mom would come by and say, you need to clean your rooms. She was like 80, 800 years old. She was old and, and about this tall. And she, you need to, Tim, listen, you need to clean your room. And I'd say, mom. A clean stable brings no profit. You know, that's what I tell her. <laughs> but if, you, if you're married or you're planning on getting married, just know this. Sometimes life gets messy. It gets messy. Amen? And that's okay. Also remember your spouse isn't perfect, and neither are you. And my friends, that's okay as well. 
But, the, but the, the temptation for way too many people is to put unrealistic expectations on their spouse, even to the point of thinking that that person is going to bring them total fulfillment in this life and make all of their dreams come true, which sounds crazy when I'm saying it out loud. We know that that's not what happens. But still, a lot of people are disappointed when it doesn't happen, which means they did have that expectation on their spouse. But here's the truth. Your fulfillment can only be found in God. Amen? So if you're expecting your mate to be your fulfillment in life, you're headed toward major disappointment. They're only a human being. Flawed, you know, just like you. In fact, two incomplete people who get together expecting the other one to make them whole to make them completely fulfilled are never gonna be satisfied in this life. You're, in fact, your spouse could be the most wonderful person ever created, but they're still not God. So what do you do? You start over in your mind. You start over in your mind. You look to God first to fulfill your deepest needs and give you total satisfaction in this life. You become a person who is completed by God, not another human being. And then you become a servant to the people around you and to your spouse, just like Jesus came into this earth to do for us. You know, the biblical view of marriage is that we're in it, not so that the other person can fulfill us. We're here on this earth and maybe we're married, so we're in that marriage relationship to serve others. So we serve God by serving others. And if you're married, the very first name on your serve list should be your spouse. So overcome the temptation of unrealistic expectations by letting God be God and then serving your spouse. Honestly, honestly, for someone here today, the best thing that you could do for your marriage, if you haven't done so already, is to put your faith in Jesus Christ and receive the forgiveness of sins that he shed his blood on the cross to give to you. He's gonna give you the strength to overcome temptations, these that we talked about today and more. And he's gonna help you to be the best spouse that you can be. I'm gonna ask our campus pastors and all of our campuses to go ahead and get ready to close out the service. But as they're coming to the stage, let me give you an update on our On the Roof Center. Okay, King David. What happened to him? Well, King David repented. He repented. And... Um, he threw himself on the mercy of Almighty God, and God was able to pick him up again and use him for his glory. And I know if God can use an adulterer, murderer, sinner, I know he can turn things around for you. He can redeem your life, and he can use you for his glory. Give him a chance to do it, amen? Love you guys so much.